um, good to see you guys. <laughs> um, we wanted to talk to you today about our math program. Um, it definitely looks different um, from, you know, when we were in school from traditional public school. Um, so we wanted to let you guys kind of know what we're doing and what our goals are with the math program. And I wanted to start just by all of us kind of thinking about when we've done math in the last month or so. Um, were you cooking? Were you shopping? Um, wallpaper, carpet, um, estimating money at the grocery store, uh, gas. So all those times that we've used math this last month. And when you think about it, um, what, what did you use most? Did you grab your calculator? Did you grab a paper and pen to write down things? Or did you use mental math? And then when you think about that, how often was it necessary for you to have the exact answer? Or was it mostly okay to just have an estimate, an idea? Um, so when I did this and thought about all these different things, I really noticed that most of the time I'm using mental math and an exact answer isn't necessary. Um, so when we teach, we want our kids to have those same skills. That's the skill that's most important. That's the skill, being able to gather the information you need. You know, if I need to know when to start dinner, I need to know how many people are eating, what I'm cooking, what the temperature is. I, the answers, the problems aren't just given to me on a nice sheet of paper. Okay, do all addition and you're going to figure out when to, when to do dinner everything you need and that's not the case I there are so many variables and um you know different pieces of information that I need and so I'm not always grabbing a calculator or a paper and pencil I'm really doing the mental math to figure out that the problem and so we want our kids to have those same skills so Hello. Hi, how are you? <laughs> and you're using math for a real purpose. Yes, yes. So math for the purpose. How many of us were taught math is divorced from the actual application of math in mm -hmm. life. And what I feel helps children so much in all the aspects of our life is if we can do more self-talk with children. When you're getting in the car and you're trying to get somewhere, let them know, okay, well, let me figure it out. I'm going 60 miles an hour. It's about 10 miles away. Let them see how you're using math in your everyday life. I've had children that have an anxiety about math and they say the anxiety of math is more prevalent than anxiety on any other subject area. Mm -hmm. And it starts as early as five years, five years old. And one of the reasons is because we get fixated that math is steps and tricks. Mm -hmm. It's a and recipe. It's, yes. it's a recipe you have to follow. And if you don't follow it exactly, it's not gonna, it's useless. And that's not true. So what our goal is, is to throw away the recipe and show you that math is everything about how do you construct mathematical knowledge in your own mind. And that word construct is vital to math. What we're more interested in and learn more about with children is their mistakes. And their mistakes are a cause for celebration. And they show with research that when we make mistakes, it's when our brain grows. I'm not interested in a child doing 20 problems and getting them all right. What do we just waste that time for? They understood what they were doing. I am looking for activities that push them a little bit right to that edge and most interested in what are all the different approaches? What are all the different solutions? So every day during math, we'll talk with the children about, okay, we have 12 kids in the class. I'm hoping to hear at least nine different approaches to this problem. And sure enough, we come up with them and every child demonstrates their different way. I wanna understand why they're thinking, do I point out their mistakes? They will realize those that in the process of talking and communicating about their map, one of the most powerful motivators for them, I, I mean, teacher really, are their peers listening to the other approaches that children 
take. Some children feel if they have a math anxiety that if I can just get through this year, I'll be okay. I'm not going to need math. But the truth is, is that we use math from the time we wake up in the morning until we go to sleep. We're constantly playing with math in different realms of our life. There's a child who has a dad that's a butcher. And I said, oh, just go home and talk to your dad about all the different ways he used math in his day that we think is separate. Children begin to think of math as something that you just do on a piece of paper and you're doing calculations, you're doing um, algorithms. And that's what we try to veer away from. We really want to create flexible thinkers. We want them to see math as something you can play with and have fun with. But today we'd like to show you some of the things we do with math to do that. Um, I think about some of the problems that we see that are so standard oh, when yeah. children do algorithms. Here. They have, I'm sure if you can see this on the screen, here's a standard what we all grew up with. And then the standard approach that children take to this is this. This is more common than doing 102. This is the answer I'll see. And what this tells me immediately is where is that child with place value and with just number sense? Because I'll ask them, okay, so show me your, tell me about your problem. They'll go, well, you know, 35 to 67, I did the 12, and this is nine, and equals 912. Okay. And what did that surprise you? With some, yeah, you know, it seemed a little high. And that immediately <laughs> gives me those insights into, all right, they're not there with their place value yet. But this is so standard. Uh -huh. You'll see it more often than the correct answer. Excuse me, I need to get an eraser. A, um, the other very common problem is when you put it into subtraction, and this happens again and again. <laughs> the answer here will be um, 35 mm -hmm. because you always take the smaller number away from the larger number. But this is much more insight that we will gain about where a child is than if they just give us the correct answer. The most and, and, one of the damaging things you could do for your child is to give them a worksheet and have them do 20 plus problems. All it does is kind of kill the joy. If they know the problem, they already know. You're going to know that when they do their first problem, how they are with their math they also understand. It. And we talk so much about doing math with a purpose. So it's always shocking. They don't question themselves. Like, yeah, this <laughs> seems right. But if they make a mistake when they're giving out cheese poofs in estimation, you know the 35 doesn't seem right because it has a purpose. Everybody, they're doing division. Everybody gets the same amount. And so that's when mistakes, it, mm -hmm. it has a, they want to do it. They, it, it has a purpose for them. And then just where, what are those stepping blocks to mathematical understanding? One of them that's very important is just <clears throat> one, one on one. I see parents that will get, um, frustrated when they're playing a game with their child and the child has seen the dice many, many times because you've been playing, you know, shoots and ladders or high ho cheerio for a long time. But until they see this as a five and have built that understanding of five, they will each time go one, two, three, four, five. And then when they have um, and you have a couple of multiple dice here. And you might be playing a game with your child and go, well, why don't they just start with five and then go <laughs> six, seven, eight? But they have they to trust that that is a five yeah. until they've done it yeah. over and over again. They have to go, it might they have to count time. it every <laughs> single time they will count it. And instead of getting them to say to them, well, wait, you know that's a five, why don't you just count it as five? The construction of mathematical knowledge is not something you can force. Once they understand this as a five, then they will know it as a five and be able to count down. It. So we do have parents who go, oh, I know my child's very good. I can give them worksheets. They do all these equations. And I'm working with the children using dice and cards. And I see them going one, two, three, four, five. That tells me that I'm not going to push them. We are just going to work on 
what is quantity of number. And we do that with repetitive games in different ways. We want it to be fun. Um, then there is the um, just the fact families. And it's great when you start to see children that understand those um, fact families. One of the things that we work the most on is just the understanding of 10. Um, no matter what the age is of a child at school, everything goes back to our understanding of 10. And many of our games, especially at the younger level, all are based on understanding what are friendly numbers and how can they work together. And once children get that sense of friendly numbers, then they're able to easily take apart numbers. Um, sometimes you'll have a child, you'll just, I'm just making up numbers here. And you'll have them added up. A child with a number sense will go look at this and go, okay, 700 plus 200, then I'll add my 36 to it and I'll take away two. And they're so fast and fluid with it because they've developed number sense. So you can tell when a child has gotten to that place and where, when that will occur for a child is different with every single child. Mm -hmm. You can start to see it in younger children just with their comfort in playing with 10. And then as they get older, you can see the children that are still not at that and they look at each problem as a separate individual problem instead of seeing how all these numbers break apart and come together. I always think of it as a beautiful dance that numbers have, if we could just um, see how play with connected. them. Yeah. yeah, how connected they are. Okay, let's, let's do some games. Let's play a little bit. So with, um, here's an easy one with numbers. I call them, of neighbors, actually. So one of the, um, when we're working with younger children, there is just that one to 10 we're working with. And what are all those different combinations that make 10? So because anytime they see a seven, I want them to look for threes. If they see a two, I want them to look for eights. But they first had to develop awareness of what just are our numbered neighbors. So in this, this game, each player would get four cards. You take out the face card and they're only looking for their neighbors here. So. Before I even begin the game, I have my six and seven. My partner over here has their nine and eight. Let me put out some more cards. And you're just trying to see how many pairs can you get. I have no neighbors. This person has no neighbors. Now we look at the card in the middle and see, do we either one of us have a plus one or a minus one from that number? No. So we keep going. Um, this person's turn. Oh, I see a number neighbor. <laughs> My turn. Oh, number neighbor. And this, this is um, critical foundation for our number awareness. One of our favorites, My favorite, is target number and make 10. This is a game you can play at all ages because it engages all of us. For May 10, they'll get about five cards. Don't get fixated on how many cards you give them. Five is a great number. Pick out the 10 here. <laughs> and all they're doing is using addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. We use those words of multiplication and division with the children at a very young age. We explain multiplication as grouping. And we do it with our estimation every week. We always put our estimation in an array of rows and columns. The children decide on how much will be in each pile. And that has to do with where are they with their skip counting. So estimation is rich with math. Here, they're looking for how, what are the different ways they can make 10? Well, easily we can see seven and three. We can see nine and one. But let's see what else we can do. We could take nine, take away one is eight, eight plus two is 10. We could do, um, let's see, nine plus seven is 16. I can use all the cards and I can <laughs> take these away. It's a very, very fun game. Kids love it. They, uh, I usually, I ask them to come up with four different ways 
to make 10 with their cards. And it's all very arbitrary. We just it's also a really nice game because you can enter at any level. Yes. So Mary Jo is doing a bunch of steps there, but yeah. maybe you're playing this with a very young child and they're just looking at the seven and three. Mm -hmm. and that's all they have. Yeah. And then they get two new cards. And this tells us so much about the child. We know, oh, they understand that seven and three are friendly numbers and they come together. I always say the numbers are and they're not they when they will count these, right? Um, as the children get older, we just step this up and say target number. And with a target number, you have different ways of doing it. You can't just pull out a card, nine, and then come up with the different ways that you can make nine. You can also do it where you use two cards, 69. What are the different ways you could use 69? Because now the children are doing multiplication. The other way we can do it is I ask a student in the classroom, just give me a two digit number. So a two digit number might be 20, 18, you said? Great, 18. 18. And then we take out our cards again. Oh, oh come on. Um, one, two, three, four, five. What I like about arbitrary target number is that it challenges all of us to figure out how to do this. So, well. Six and three. I figured it out. <laughs> um, nine. Oh, look at these. Six plus three plus two plus seven, 18. You can feel your mind. It's all excited. Oh, let me look for another one, another one. This is playing with numbers. Much better than any worksheet and extends it so much. Come another one. Oh, isn't it fun? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so this is one of my oh, ultimate favorites. I actually come from a place of believing you can do it every day in your classroom. It doesn't take a lot of time. It's a great way. I'm a big, when my children were young, we always carried um, a deck of cards in my purse and in the car. And anytime we went to the restaurant, we would whip those out and play games. It could be maybe something so simple as playing spoons. But it's a great way to pass that time in a restaurant anywhere where you're waiting. You're engaging in your children. They want nothing more than to have that time with you one on one. So bring some dice and cards in your purse, and you'll find that there's an endless amount of games you can play. Um, this one is finding 15. You don't use your face cards, and you're just removing two to three cards, pull 15, and then replacing. So uh, right here, three and two, if the way down three more cards and we just play and play. So they're endless, but you can do over here. Oh, this is a good one because you could do it for addition, track, and multiple. I spy. You just um, I would say to my partner, I spy two cards that have a sum of seven. So we're using the vocabulary, some means we're adding, and then my partner would try to find two cards. They do not need to be the two cards I saw, but their cards do need to equal seven. So Jane, could you please find two cards that equal seven? You can also change it to, I find two cards that have a difference of four. And then your partner would find two cards with a difference of four not necessarily the cards that I found. And it could go for multiplication. I find two cards that equal, have a product of 21. You can change this for number sense when they're just getting to understand what a number is by turning them over and do a memory game. And for a memory game, you could even just use your ace to five to begin and just put out all your cards, ace and five, and they're going to be turning them over and try to find two matches. Oh, six and five don't work. I'll and then try also again. just number recognition. Mass I spy a 10 mm -hmm. for the younger students. We also did bingo like this in our class oh, where no. you flipped it over and it was against two people so they could play and whoever found they had the card. That was really fun. Oh, is this where you write it up? Is this knockout? Yeah, I kind of like knockout, same idea. Question. Do yes, you guys call it an ace or a one or an A or what do you get on the A? 
Um, we do say the aces are one. Yeah. Oh, one. Okay. Yeah. And I just, I, I know for myself, I do call it aces. Oh, okay. still. Um, I think it goes back and forth because we become so polluted. But yeah. And then with the kings, queens, and jacks, we can sometimes mm -hmm. have those be 13, 12, and 11. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're just all 10. Another game that I enjoy very much playing with students is black on um, blackjack. Oh. Blackjack <laughs> is incredible. Chase. You know, Chase, it is a great math game. <laughs> Chase came home one day and was explaining it to me. I was like, oh, I think you guys were playing blackjack. Yeah. Yeah. Let me take the Thunder Valley. <laughs> <laughs> and they play really well. Um, it also, it engages children at all different levels. You don't have to be real high mathematical level to play blackjack. You just have to be able to add numbers to 21. So it works well. And also because it does, it involves um, probability, it involves a lot of strategy. You, we, I do encourage them to look at their neighbor's cards and see you know, how many queens have we seen come up? How many face cards have come up? Just that awareness. Um, any child would enjoy it more than doing regular math worksheets. So our math program is game-based and project-based. Right now, we've been doing a lot of probability, and it'd be it's amazing how much they enjoy it. They were getting into a penny war game in the first, second grade class last week, and they were so excited about the penny war game. It really just had to do with two people flipping coins, and whoever got the heads got to keep both coins, mm -hmm. and then they both had heads, they had a war that went on, just like doing a card war game, but how excited they were by it, and they've been doing games to find out what is the probability with the head and the tails and what if you throw in a third variable, how much does that change it? Now they're working on doing averaging. So they've been doing averaging. Okay, now you're okay. Okay, you're okay now. When we are then all the day, the sequence, and then the numbers, I Can you repeat now, that? Your guys' bandwidth was low. Yeah, we are doing averaging on a concrete level by using Unifix cubes. Let me stay with the So an example would be they have different MMs. So they count up the MMs that each child had for maybe this child was looking at blue MMs, another child's looking at brown MMs. And so they'll have the number of MMs that each child had of that color. And then to average it out, they simply make all their columns equal. And this is a way for us to understand what averaging is and then to take it to the context of our everyday life. When do we use averaging? We actually use it almost every day. You use it when you're cooking. What's the average amount of food that people in my family will eat? We don't realize how much math is um, kind of like weaved all through our day. Right now, they're working on posters of the average girl in this class and the average boy in the class. So they go around, they have to take the height and weight of everyone and come out to that middle place, hair color, eye color, favorites. And it's a way of taking something that seems very abstract mm -hmm. and bringing it into their life and making it relevant and concrete. And when we, it's interesting when kids come in at an older age, like in a grade level, and you know they have a lot of experience with averaging probably on worksheets and they never know what to do to find the average and sometimes they'll put the numbers in order from least to greatest like they get the average the mean median and mode very mode very confused um and they also don't know how to find the average do i divide 
um, do I, what do I divide it by? And they just have, it's completely abstract. They're still trying to follow that recipe and not really understanding the context. Too often in a classroom, the teacher is seen as the vessel of all the knowledge and whether something is right or wrong. What we do is we make it that we're all I think we lost Jane. We're back. Okay. So children give meaning to ideas. We have our classrooms have a very high level of talk that goes on in them and math talk, I think it's so vital for, how do you make sense of it? What do you think of that approach? Why do you feel that works? So it's it's getting them to expand their thinking more and more and to, it is the self-talk that we're always saying is so important. We want children to self-talk about why does something want to make sense? Rather than a focus on a right answer, mm -hmm. how quickly you can get the answer, how you do it. There is a, I want to find a quote here from a woman that we've been following for years, um, Joe Bowler at Stanford, who says all problems could be solved in different ways and we should embrace that. Number flexibility, being able to work with numbers and see what they are made of and combine them in different ways is one of the most important parts of number sense. So when you're with your children, rather than going down the lake shore and getting <laughs> your workbook, pull out a deck of cards, take the games out of the cabinet and play with them. Your, What's great about it is your child sees that you're doing the same thing as they are. Um, I think there's something very disrespectful when we say that they have to do these younger activities and we're going to do these other activities. The best game are games that we can all play as equals as much as possible. So bring out the card games and you do those with the children. Wish you were here so you could ask us some do you have any questions? Did we go over Excel and then play that? I'm, I'm looking for my sheet. I might have lost it with the animal. It's okay if you don't have it on you. We can. Oh, roll it in a right. I'm sorry. I made a copy of it. That's why. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jane, can you read the next one? So here's the Excel. It has a lot of different numbers on it. And we have quite a few. <laughs> Wow, oh, cabinet's full of games. On this one, we roll three dice and make equations to equal one. So I have here a three, three, and four. And I'm trying to cross out all the different numbers out here. So we easily can do a 10, we can cross out mm -hmm. just by adding. Uh, we can do some multiplication. Jane, can you move closer? Thank you. Here. Multiply here. Three times four is 12. Um, and I could take away three from it, get the nine. I could also do it as three, take away three is zero, zero times four, but it doesn't work here. One of the things that occurs very early here is we talk about with children about using parentheses and using brackets because we do so many games that come out with long equations that it's very important for them to learn what operation do you wanna work on first. So at a much younger age than what I learned, they begin to use parentheses and brackets. I think of it as I say, it's a map. You're gonna give us a map of how you want us to approach your problem through your parentheses and brackets. I like to play this game as a whole group. I write the numbers up on the whiteboard and it's called erase it. And when somebody shouts out an equation, we erase it and see how quickly we can get rid of all the numbers. One of the damaging 
parts to our development of mathematical understanding is what we pass on to our children as strong as genetics. When we say, oh, I've always been really anxious about math. Or, oh, I really don't like math. Or I can only do math to a certain, a certain level. When we do that negative self-talk, we give that to their ch our child instead of the children seeing that our struggles mm -hmm. and our challenges are always when we're going to learn. If you think back in your own life, it's when you were pushed the most on something that you knew you had to be thinking all the time, you had to be alert. When everything's going really fine, we're not, it feels nice, but we're not <laughs> learning anything. <laughs> So there is that degree of stress that's very healthy for us. So we do want to come up with activities that challenge each one of us. And I just, I believe worksheets are a very flat way to learn anything. There's no interaction. And discourse is what it's all about. Well, here's an example. You can tell how old this is by the price of a latte. But um, this was when we say, um, the children will do an activity on how they use something over a year. Some of them done toilet paper, <laughs> toothpaste, oh, right in the last week for averaging, just how long does it take to make a piece of butter and toast. And this one was about how much you would spend if you bought a latte, double tall latte, four days a week for a year. But those have been, they've looked at their dog dishes, mm -hmm. their, how much they feed their dog and blew a bowl onto here. Think about how you can use, I always think of the easy way to use math at just a beginning level is with children helping to set the table. Uh, especially if you have company coming over, doing laundry. Um, here are a bunch of socks. How many pairs do you think we'll come up with with those socks? It's, they want to be engaged. So find ways that you can engage your child in math through your everyday life. I think of any other thing to think of anything in the younger class. It's so much on just the beginning awareness of 10. Um, one activity we've done that they really enjoy to do it at home too is counting your pocket. Oh, yeah. Um, and so we stick something in their pocket so they have that immediate um, knowledge of bringing it out and seeing it in front of them because they're trying to look at all their pockets on their body and that you know, gives them that chance to see it in front of them. But um, that the whole family can do that depending on. And the great thing with the pocket activity is they use the unifix cubes. Mm -hmm. And then when they take out their unifix cubes, maybe I only have three, but over here, Kristen had four mm -hmm. and you had three more. So they make trains of 10 with them. And then with that, they're able to see how all these different add-ins come together to make 10. That makes it a, a more fun mm -hmm. and engaging yeah. way to use counting in your everyday life. Would you mind touching on estimation? I am so <laughs> sorry. I just threw away all those oh, egg cartons of pretzels <laughs> a minute ago. Um, up on the, um, on the website though, or on the, um, um, There's this poster too. <laughs> um, I've been doing estimation for 30 years, and I won't say that with our, con our focus now on healthier eating has become a real challenge for teachers in the classroom. I have not yet been able to find a child that's real interested in counting out Q-tips or Unifix <laughs> cubes, but wow, they love anything that's food-based. So I have a jar that we put it in and we first talk about a range because just quantity is very difficult. And I am always the first to let people know that estimating is something I'm always working on. So we um, usually try to have it halfway full. Don't cross arm and leg and don't really kill you with additives. 
and bring them in. So when they do their estimation, we talk about what would a handful be? And then sometimes we'll go in and we'll just take out a handful. That's a nice handful. Count it out. Two, four, six, seven. And then the students, remember, would be full. And we try to um, figure out how the estimate would be in here. And then that gets us into, okay, if you think there'd be 20 of those, let's think about how they'll help our numbers. And the number just for last week when it was Asking from 42 to 250. There are times when we will do something so large that we will do half of the container. They reassess their estimation. In. Because in life, we do the assessment constantly when we're working on things. But this gives you a quick idea of how it works. I think egg cartons to be great if your items are small. Because, and if they're not, we actually have a sheet that we lay them out in with rows and columns. The students always decide on how much for pretzels. They actually did them in groups of four for the first, second, third, and fourth class. Great class. All of them decided to do four. So then we go into okay, there's how many rows, how many. I think we we lost them, um, but I want to make a comment while they are getting coming back to us. Celine has been doing the games that Mary Jo talked about um, in kindergarten and first grade. So Celine has a very strong number of sense, both Celine and Sophia, because these the both of them are the two has been playing these games for a long time, and I can see her just very strong number of sense and doing estimation. Um, so we, uh, I have a hard copy of the card games that we can send out as attachment. So you can see the instructions and examples that in case you want to play those card games or dice games. Um, she started with, you know, just under 10, you know, looking for 10 ways to add things uh, by 10 looking for the friendly numbers and then later on when the grades go higher she was looking at uh, um, like a play hundreds three digits hundred games that one was good that took her a while because it was hard to add a hundred so it's like a marriage or they forgot that extra 10 need to be carried um, so I have that game too in, in case that your child's at the much higher level of a math um, and so yeah, math is really everything. Oh, sense. they're back. Okay. I was just chiming in uh, waiting you guys come back and then talk, share my experience of uh, Celine's strong number of sense because the games that you talk about early, the dice game, card games that he she played, built her, helped her to build those very strong number of sense. Mm -hmm. You can go ahead, Mary. Yeah. What I enjoy about estimation is it's that organic way of bringing multiplication into their life without it seeming like they're, okay, now we're going to study something new, multiplication. They're using it all the time. We always talk about multiplication is just addition, guys. You're just doing addition. It's just a faster form of addition. And for something like this, it's 18. And um, so if you had 18 and 18, I should pull out some of their math journals so you can see it. Majority of children will look at it as a 20 plus 16. This is which is what I'm I'm looking for them. I want them to look at it that way. I really want them to play with their numbers instead of going, okay, it's eight and eight. The way I can only put on one. I'm going to carry this one. It's not a one, it's a 10. This is showing that you really understand what the quantity of these numbers are and what they mean when you can work on it that way. Um, one of the other games that they're trying to play is digit place. And this is a quick key. 
number, digit, place, I'm going to come up with a two digit number and it cannot have repeating digits. Okay. Um, so please guess the two digit number 14. 14. And then up here you'll have all the digits there possible up to nine. And 14, I'll say no, neither one of those digits are in my number and they're not in the right place. So now we can get rid of the one. I'd like to guess another number. Thirty-two. 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 Um, one digit is in my number. It's not in the right place. Crystal, a number. Twenty-nine. No, go ahead. No, twenty-nine. Twenty-nine. Okay, so when as soon as Crystal said twenty-nine, I knew. Oh, all right. She's testing one of the numbers. Not all children will do that. So you immediately get to see how are they with their comforted numbers and strategy. So 29, um, one digit is correct and it is in the right place. Okay. <laughs> Three, then I wouldn't know which you wouldn't know which number was right. But that, that is what occurs. And Getting a zero zero is always a great score because you can immediately eliminate those ones are become more difficult. And then we go on and on until we guess the number. And they can play this game forever. You just don't want there to be a lot of wait time for it. And then to make it really fair, the next person who comes up is not the person who guessed the number, it's just the next person in line because guessing the number has to do with where was your place here and goes what is what is your developing knowledge and we shouldn't be discriminated against if we're still just trying to figure out these numbers so we keep a running sheet in the class if we just have turns to a digit place so math is all around and nowadays on the computer you can just put in the computer our games five-year-old and you'll get some great things and you can make sense of it yourself and how you think that'll be for your child Oh, testing. We can always talk about some other things that parents might be wondering. No, we don't do testing. I, I don't. There's, I don't believe it serves anything. It definitely won't serve me because I'm going to find out about children by working with them. And just like everything in our life, our entire journey in our life is always um, learning new things and falling down every day and then getting back up and then trying things again. The testing only kind of hits us, I feel, against one another. One of the things that can be hard is when you have children that really want to, like, I know these answers, like, please wait. I want to hear all the other people because there will be people that will be very reluctant just as in any subject to speak up about what they think might be possible. And I want them to take risks in their mathematical thinking, realizing that it is a lifelong understanding. I hope this has helped you um, understand why we will not give your child a sheet of equations to work on and that this, I've seen it work. Um, math is probably the one thing I would say most alumni will talk about that they enjoyed the most and really felt strong when they left RCS. Is it different when you go into a, another school setting and things are by a textbook and a worksheet? Yes, it is different, but they've developed a number of sense of awareness that you can apply all through your life. So, thank you. <laughs> All right, guys, any questions? Oh, we, we do. Nope. Mm -mm. I'm just thinking um, concerns for parents often come up with, um, you know, touching more on what happens when my child leaves, what happens when they go to that fourth or fifth grade classroom, how do they do? Because they haven't been exposed 
to all the things they would traditionally be exposed to. Um, you know, we don't start long division here until the older program, which we, which used to be the fifth and sixth right. grade. Um, and so they might go into a fourth grade classroom and be expected to do long division. Um, but they have such an understanding of what division is that it can be a struggle and I don't believe they're development mentally ready for it. Um, and when we do it, we wait and, um, you know, they understand it within a month. We right. do long division for a month and they do learn that recipe, that process, but I would never start it had they not had that concrete understanding of dividing pretzels. <laughs> it's the same concept, just bigger numbers. Um, so they're more ready for it. And when they're memorizing all those steps, they just logically make sense to them. They know what they're doing. Um, whereas if we taught it in third or fourth grade, we could spend six months trying to really um, beat that process into them and going over it again and again. And if they're not ready. So it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't stick and it takes a lot longer for them to learn. Which is why traditional schools teach the same thing every single year. Mm -hmm. It's such a waste of time. Same thing with fractions. Mm -hmm. We don't do fractions until they really understand multiplication. Because to work with fractions, you have to use multiplication. Mm -hmm. And until you have that fluency in it. So why beat it into them at a time when Really, that's not where they are in their construction of and math fractions right are now. Hard for kids, but fractions are very abstract. But ask an adult to explain the division of fractions. Why do we divide them that way? Mm -hmm. I mean, it'd be very hard to find adults that can explain it. So if you wait, they will get things so much faster. I think of that with um, even with some of the geometry. Mm -hmm. I, I went to a kindergarten classroom. It was so painful. We go do visiting of other classrooms. It was a kindergarten classroom in Elk Grove. And this was before COVID, but they were doing the whiteboard power computer thing. And they had the, these young kindergarten children using graph paper to draw a hexagon on the graph paper. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, these little kindergartners. They're just trying to make squares and circles. And we have them doing a hexagon by corner to corner. And you could see how painful it was for the children. And what they developed and said instead was they have this sense of such failure. I'm not able to do this. And I'm sitting there as an observer going, why are we having them do this? They're not. And, you know, it's not a regurgitation. Why are we having them do this? What relevance is it? And I know as an educator, what's really important is to get that foundation of our number system. And we lose it by jumping into other things. That's great. Maybe five kids out of 25 of those would remember the following week what a hexagon is. What is the, what's the intention? We've just stuck all the love, all the excitement out of it. Well, I can just add to that. It's Brett Morgan's mom, you know, having a 12 year old who's never had a formal math lesson and does fine on these standardized tests for, you know, forced to take through the charter that like their number sense is so strong that they can deduce from four options, you know, especially when it's multiple choice. But like for me, learning to trust when they were younger, <laughs> that things were happening through baking and slime and all of that was like really hard because it was just so different for me. And so, you know, I wish I could go back now that I have a, you know, sixth grader and tell my <laughs> younger parenting self, like all of these things matter and that conceptually are so strong. And to the point of like estimating, like how often do we actually need an accurate <laughs> number um, that the concept it's, it's like stored in them in a way that's not wrote or memorized. And it's just so much more functional in a practical sense. And Brett, I think it also, you know, if you see your children's friends, that are at public school, you see the homework that they're doing, or you see the problems that they're solving, that part can be intimidating too. Like, oh no, what is my child missing? Is this really, like, it's that trust that is so hard. <laughs> and it's not negating that there are times you need exact numbers. Mm -hmm. You're cutting wood, you better have an exact measurement, do it twice. It's just that the majority of the time, I want children first to enjoy it. And if we focus on right and wrong, 
we stop, we don't take the risks because we're so worried about being wrong. Thank you. Any more questions? All right, guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. You the Thank you. animal man. Oh, are we done? Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. I will share the the activities.